for those of you that don't know, the bass player today was Scott Phillips. Hi, Scott! Good morning! Trained by him, so if I messed up, it's his fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you know that we like to uh, highlight one of the ministries that we support uh, at least once a year, if it's at all possible. Uh, and so today is one of those days we have an opportunity to uh, highlight one of those ministries. And Belinda is going to introduce our speaker, and uh, they're going to share a testimony, and then uh, when they're finished, I'll do it. get permission to say something I wanted to say. It's all about the pastor. Amen. It's a different story in my home. As he was saying, you all know that every now and then we like to highlight one of the ministries that this church gives to. And you all have heard Jim say from time to time that this church gives 50% of what comes in away. And Chrysalis is one of the recipients of that. Yeah! And I don't know that any of you or many of you have ever heard the exact amount that goes to Chrysalis each month. But $600 goes from this church to Christmas every month. Yeah. So today we have with us Kelsey. Kelsey and Jason, where are you? Over here. Kelsey is a two-year graduate from Christmas and doing well. Jason is her husband and I can tell a great support. Kelsey, did you finish the 18-month program? Yeah. So you were probably one of the first graduates of that program. Yeah. yeah. It was actually changed from one year to 18 months when I was in the program, so I wasn't very happy about it at the time. But <laughs> <laughs> it was good, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it was good. So we have Kelsey here today to tell us what's going on in her life that put her in Chrysalis and what's going on in her life since Chrysalis. And we just want to realize that Kelsey is one of many. One of many. I don't know if you, any of you, but I know some of you have the opportunity each year to go to the graduation and see those faces cross that stage and tell their testimonies. And this is just one of those testimonies. And I am so thankful to be a part of that. Um, and you guys are such a vital part of that. And as you know, the ladies group, Christmas puts together bags that we take. And we are just excited about Christmas and the, the work that's done there. Okay, so I'm a little bit nervous because I didn't know that there would be this many people. <laughs> but uh, my name is Kelsey and I am 26 years old. And I'm going to try and do this without crying very much. But um, you guys are just such a blessing. And... God just uses you so much without you even really knowing it. And um, I just want to thank all of you for whatever you've done to help Christmas because God has used that so much in my life. And I don't know, I'd probably be dead or in prison without it. And so um, I was 16. I grew up in Eagle, Idaho. Um, I went to a local church there my whole life. Um, when I was 16, I was introduced to... Uh, methamphetamines and I had, I didn't have any clue about what that was or anything like that I had never really been taught about drugs and so um, it was all downhill from there pretty much I ran away from home and quit dropped out of school and um, my parents were just at a loss they had no idea what to do with me they didn't know what I was doing necessarily and so when I was 17 my mom took me to the Walker Center and by that time I had kind of gotten into some um, dark things. I knew who God was. You know, I didn't believe in Him anymore, and I felt that I could do it on my own, and I didn't need that. And so, I went to the Walker Center, got out, and went on the run, and was introduced to heroin. And I became a heroin addict and started selling heroin and um, all that stuff that goes along with it. Um, 
And then I'm just going to skip a lot because there's a lot that goes into the story, but we don't have time for it. So um, when I was 23, I got arrested um, right in front of the Vineyard Church, which I didn't know was there at the time. And um, there was a car lot there, and it was called Freedom Car Lot. And by that time, I thought, you know, I'm for sure going to be a junkie forever. You know, I'm going to be sleeping on people's couches and um, that kind of stuff for the rest of my life. So when I got arrested, it was the middle of the summer. It was August 18th. And it was like 105 degrees outside. And I weighed probably like 80 pounds. So I was really sick. And um, I looked up at the Freedom Car Lot sign and I was in handcuffs and I was just like, okay, I'm surrendering this. I can't do this anymore. And I just knew at that point that God had set me free from that lifestyle. And I got out of jail 60 days later. My parents wouldn't bond me out, which was really weird because they always did bond, bond me out of everything. So my mom had always said, go to Chrysalis, go to Chrysalis. She had volunteered there for a long time. And I decided I needed to go there um, to get some life skills. And so I went to Chrysalis, went into the program, and it was a struggle for me because um, it was just all new. And I remember one time, I think I was actually a house manager at this point, so I had graduated the program and I was running a house there. And you guys had done, you did this rally, um, I don't remember what it was, it was like a rally. And it ended up, yeah, it ended up at the main Chrysalis house on 25th and State. And there was an auction and um, like a lunch and stuff. And there was a quilt there. And so every time I say this story, I just like cry so much. But uh, there was a quilt. And there was somebody bidding on the quilt. But I don't know if somebody made it from this church. Yeah. Okay. And um, it was like. $100, $200, $300, and I was just like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I was like, I told Marsha, I said, is all this money for us? And she's like, yeah. And I just was in such awe because I just had never felt that much love for people that didn't even know me. And um, it was like the most amazing thing, and I just started crying. And it kept going up from there, and I can't remember how much exactly was um, spent on that quilt necessarily, but I just was like so blown away by that. And I will never forget that um, because God uses you guys to show us love when we don't know what that looks like. Um, and so uh, right now I'm a full-time volunteer at Chrysalis. Uh, it is an 18-month program. We have four houses. And so right now we have about 32 women in the program. So we're just growing and growing and having an overwhelming amount of women that want to come in and change their lives and have their hearts changed and uh, walk with Christ. And so it's just really amazing to see the work that Jesus does every day. And um, we're so blessed by you guys. One of the homes um, up off of Franklin is actually one of your guys' homes, and I lived in that house. And... Um, it's just really awesome. And so we do classes Monday or Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Um, Sunday nights is kind of a dinner and a, maybe more of like a social for the women to fellowship with each other. And usually a church small group comes and brings a meal for us. And then we have a little class time. And then Wednesday night's more of a structured class where it's from 7 to 9. And they learn things from like Andy Stanley and um, boundaries and that kind of stuff. Um, so you guys are just a huge blessing, and I don't know very many of you, but I just love you all so much, and um, I don't know, we're really excited um, for what God's doing through Chrysalis. Uh, I just did a video for Chrysalis not very long ago, and I was thinking about it, and the work that God does through Chrysalis is so amazing because it helps our whole community, you know, and like... Uh, I don't know, I just love you guys. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to say. Or... Okay, all right. So, I, like I said, I volunteer full-time. I'm married, and we just bought a house in November. And we just got a puppy. And so, yeah. 
So God's just done an amazing work in my life, and I just want to be able to give back however I can. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for everything that you do and just being there. I met these guys, and I'm sure some of the others of you did when we had our rally this year at the Baskin Robbins, where we it was our destination. And we have another Christmas person here, Nicole, right? Yeah. <coughs> Nicole's here. <coughs> she was so excited when she found out that there was someone else from Christmas here. <laughs> so that's cool. But yeah, it's a it's an awesome program, and uh, we're so thankful to get to be a part of it. So that's one of the ministries our church supports uh, regularly. There, there are six others, and uh, excuse me, uh, it's a little difficult to have someone from Haiti every year here, and we've not managed at all to have someone from uh, Jewish Force Ministries, which is a worldwide ministry. Yet. We've never contacted them to invite someone, but I'm sure they probably wouldn't be able to come anyway. But most of the others, we, we have uh, someone during the year that comes and shares just a little bit about what's going on. And, and I just want to, you to be encouraged by that because uh, I think one of the things that God is using this church for is to be involved in ministries in that manner. You know, most churches have a lot of overhead with buildings and to pay for and all that kind of stuff. And we don't have a lot of overhead. So that enables us to be a little bit unique in that way and be able to, to involve ourselves in more ministry than we would if we had a building and all those kind of things. <clears throat> and God may change his mind someday and want us to have that, but right now he doesn't. And uh, we're happy with that and uh, thankful that we can do it this way because I believe ultimately uh, it's going to bless more people than if we had a building somewhere. <clears throat> One other thing I want to share this morning. Most of you know that Mo has been visiting Dutch Granick for five years, six years? Six years. Six years. Dutch is a, a man I met at Maximum Security back seven years ago, I guess. And uh, Dutch, Dutch has passed. He was one of the main uh, leaders of the Aryan nation. He had caused that prison more trouble than you could even shake a stick at. And... Uh, <clears throat> Through a series of, of coincidences, not coincidences, but God's planning, uh, God just enabled me to make friends with Dutch as a volunteer uh, chaplain, which that shouldn't have happened at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, it did, and uh, and Mo started visiting Dutch, writing to him and visiting, and she has faithfully visited him for all these six years now. The church supports him with just a little bit of spending money each month. He had nothing for years, no way to buy any coffee or uh, even deodorant, uh, anything like that. But anyway, through that six years, he's really grown and matured as a Christian. And uh, the person that he was, his track record at maximum security, keeps him locked down in AdSeg 24-7. One, one hour a day to be handcuffed and taken to a shower or something like that and back. So he knows and the people there know that he would never be able to overcome his track record there, no matter how much he changed. And he's tremendously changed. But they remember him from when, okay? So what's going to happen for him is next month he's being moved to another prison. And what that's going to do is going to give him the opportunity to go into that new prison, the new person that he is, not the old Dutch. And, uh, and that's going to make it possible for him to get out of lockdown, to be able to have a job in the prison, all kinds of things that he's just not been able to do. Be involved in programs he's not been able to take, and it's just a real, real, real exciting thing. I just wanted to share that because we knew there was plans for it. But the warden, uh, Mo told me this morning, saw him last week and said it will be sometime next month. Don't know where he's going yet, but uh, we hope it will be somewhere close where uh, Mo can still make visits with him occasionally. But wherever he goes, we have assured him that, that uh, we will still be sending him uh, that little bit of money each month 
to make life a little better for him. But uh, that's another thing that's not even part of our regular uh, giving to things. That that's another special thing that we've been able to do. And I know it's made a big change in his life. And I know that Mo has made a big change in his life. And, and uh, that's just a good story to tell. And I, I wanted you to to hear that and to know that. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to pick up this morning where we left off last week. Oh, let me say one other thing. I want to thank three people, or five people, I guess it is, this morning. Uh, Mike and uh, Stitch and Bonnie and uh, Dave and Katie are going to do something for us this afternoon. They're going to go and be with, uh, with uh, Brett and Jennifer. They're doing a music video for one of their CDs. Uh, and they needed uh, three bikers and uh, I was going to have to leave the ride this afternoon so I worked around and tried to find some people that would go and they consented to go so thank you so much guys for going and do that they needed to look like bikers have bikes and have a black vest they got all those things but thank you seriously, guys. Yes. What? What did I say? Brett and Kelly. Brett and Jennifer is our son and daughter. <laughs> Brett and Kelly. You know who I'm talking about. Brett and Kelly. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 15 is where we'll be today. We're going to be looking at verses 20 through 23. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 20. In our previous study, Paul had been dealing with the consequences of denying the resurrection of the body. And today, he turns to the certainty of the resurrection of Christ, and he's going to show us the consequences of of the resurrection of Christ and again show us its certainty. So let's begin with verse 20 as we begin to see these consequences that are available to everyone who will come to faith in Christ because of the resurrection of Christ. He says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now this verse begins with two very important words, and you may not think they're very important, but they are. They are, but now. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead. In verse 19, he had pointed out the fact that if Christ had not been raised from the dead, then we as Christians, all the hope we had would be what we had in this life. And if that's all we had as Christians, then we were to be most pitied is the way that the Spirit of God led Paul to put that. Now, that is the case if Christ was not raised from the dead. Christians would be most pitied. Now, he uses this but here as an adversity to show us something contrary here. So far from the Christian being the one that is most pitied in the world, the facts that he presents here about the resurrection changes that whole situation. Now, when he uses the word now, he's not talking about now in terms of time, but he's talking about a conclusion. So if we put this together, what he's basically saying by this, but now Christ has been raised from the dead is, but it is not so. Christ has been raised from the dead. Because you remember in the verses before, he was talking about it from the perspective of the false teaching that people were teaching that there was no resurrection of the dead and he went into it in great detail to say look if there's no resurrection of the dead then Christ hasn't been raised and if Christ hasn't been raised then you're still in your sins your faith is worthless and all of the things that he said concerning that is consequences so what he's saying by those two words in the Greek is it is not so this teaching that is out there that there is no resurrection of the dead, it is not so. Christ has been raised from the dead. So without doubt, Paul is showing 
<clears throat> that the teaching of no resurrection of the dead and therefore no resurrection of Christ is a false teaching. Now, he uses the Greek perfect tense here in the verb to rise or to, to rise. Not only did Christ rise from the dead on a specific day, which we know that the Scripture teaches, but He is per permanently risen from the dead. He is still alive today. He is risen to face death never again. And that's what He's showing us here in the, the Greek tense of the use of that verb. Now, He also goes on and says uh, this about the first fruits. Now, He's saying that Christ is the first fruits. In order to understand that, we need to go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, one of the sacrifices that the Jewish people were to make was the first fruits of their harvest. So if they were uh, <coughs> cutting wheat, they would make a sheaf or a stalk like a wheat, and they would first of all take that to the temple uh, in the Old Testament days and offer it as a sacrifice to God. And that would be something that would really be dedicating the whole harvest that was to come to God. But more importantly, it would be saying that there was a greater harvest to follow. They had this little bit. They offered to God. God, it's all yours, but yet there's greater fruit to come when they make the rest of the harvest. So when we put this together then, Paul is showing that Christ is the first fruit of those who rise from the dead. And you say, well, how can that be? Because Jesus raised people from the dead. How can He be the first? We need to realize that those that Jesus raised from the dead came back to life. But what happened to them? They died again. It was more like resuscitation, if you want to put it that way. Because they were not raised eternally. They died again. But Jesus was raised as the first fruits from the dead, never to die again. And that's the significance of the difference. So His resurrection then was to a life that knows no death. And in this way, then Jesus becomes the forerunner, it says here, of all those who are asleep. Now we need to understand that term. Those who are asleep here is a term that is used other places in Scripture. And it's clear as to how it's used. It is used to talk about the Christians who have died. It's not talking about people that are just taking a nap. It is a term used different times to talk about the Christians who have died. Those who have died with faith in Christ. So when we put all of this together in this verse, this is what it's saying to us. Paul is teaching that the resurrection of Christ is a promise and a proof that all those who have died with faith in Christ will someday be resurrected also. That's what he's teaching here. So he's saying that, that this is a fact. He has risen. This is a fact and a proof. Him being the first fruits. That every person who places faith and trust in Jesus Christ will someday, if Jesus tarries in His return, will someday die. Their body will go to the grave. At that point in time, their spirit and soul will go to be with the Lord because the Bible says for the Christian to be absent from the body is to be present immediately with the Lord. The next thing is to be present with Him. But we know that when Jesus comes in the rapture, we're going to talk about that later, that that body and spirit, I mean that soul and spirit that's been with Jesus as that person died as a Christian, when Jesus comes in the rapture, they will be resurrected and their body and their soul and spirit will be united into a resurrection eternal body just like the one Jesus has, never to die again. So this is the teaching here. So, it's not only the fact of good news that Jesus has been raised, but it's the proof and assurance that everyone who has faith in Jesus will also be resurrected at some time in the future and receive an eternal heavenly resurrection body. Now, let's go on with verse 21. 
He says, For since by, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Here Paul is going back and referring to Adam. And of course he's referring to Adam's sin and the fact that it resulted in death. Adam and Eve were told, you can enjoy everything here but the fruit of one tree. Don't eat that. And he told them what was going to happen to them. <clears throat> they ate it instead. And uh, at that point, death entered the world. Now, Adam and Eve didn't die at that very moment. But they died spiritually. And they ultimately did die, which if sin had to enter, they would have never died physically even. So that's what happened at that point. So their sin resulted in physical death for the whole human race. And we're going to talk more about it in a minute. It resulted in spiritual death for them. And we'll talk more about how that works with others in just a minute. So Adam's sin brought death. It brought death not only to himself, but to all mankind. And so Jesus, or Paul is saying here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that by the man Adam came death. And that's who he's referring to and what he's meaning here. Now, on the other hand, he shows us that by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. And in other portions of Scripture, Jesus is referred to as that other man here. And many times it's referred to as Adam is the first man, the first Adam, and Jesus is the second Adam. And Jesus is the man through which uh, the resurrection came. So Christ's resurrection then provides a resurrection from death for all who believe in Him. Now, Paul is repeated here by man. And what this does, it shows us the humanity of Christ. And this is important for us to realize. Because we have to understand, in order to be correct in our understanding about Christ and be talking about the true biblical Jesus, we have to understand that Jesus was fully man. He was as much man as Adam. Adam sinned. Jesus overcame the temptation to sin as a man. But at the same time, we have to understand that the Bible teaches that Jesus was uniquely fully God. And if we don't believe and teach that Jesus is fully man and fully God, then we're teaching about a false Jesus. And that's an important thing to realize because both of those things are true about Jesus. So it was by the first Adam then, by man that death entered the human race, and it is by the second man, the second Adam, Jesus, that death is overcome. And that's what Paul is saying here. So the first man brought death to the human race. The second man brought eternal life. And so this is just taking it right on down the line here to show us the consequences of the fact that Jesus did, was resurrected from the dead and what it means to us today. Now let's go on to verse 22. He says for, and I think Corncob spoke of this verse a while ago, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. So, he's saying here, in Adam, all die. And he's pointing out the mortality of the entire human race. And if Jesus tarries, we're going to all die at some point in time. And that physical death has come because of Adam's sin. Now, everyone who lives long enough to become accountable for their actions and know right from wrong, everyone that lives to be old enough to know right from wrong, everyone is going to sin. That came to us by Adam. The physical death came because of his sin. The potential for the spiritual death and sin came to us because we're human. It's not that Adam's sin made you a sinner. Instead, Adam's sin brought physical death to the human race. 
but it brought into the mix and the ingredients here that everyone who lives to be old enough to know right from wrong will choose to do wrong. And at that moment, that becomes that person's spiritual death and separation from God. To make us spiritually dead and separated from God. You see, a lot of people can look at the Old Testament with the account of Adam and you can say, well, God said He was going to die if He sinned, if He ate the, the wrong fruit. And He lived another 800 years, or how long it was. Adam died spiritually that day. He was separated from God in the relationship he'd had with God from before. And so, not only then did He bring physical death in, but the potential that every one of us would choose to sin ourselves and therefore become spiritually dead and separated from God. Now, likewise, as he's saying here that in Adam all die, then he says in Christ all are made alive. Now we've got to be very careful with this verse of Scripture right here. In Christ all are made alive. We need to realize that this is not referring, as some people think, to the fact that there is a universal salvation of all people. The all who will be made alive refers to those who have turned from sin and placed faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. We know that it's not talking about universal salvation for everyone, whether they've accepted Christ or not. That's the way some people try to teach this verse of Scripture. But we know that that's not the case because other portions of Scripture teach us about the judgment, the severe penalty and the judgment that comes to those who fail to accept Christ. So, we need to learn something from this. We need to interpret Scripture in the context of the Scripture always. We need to interpret it in the context of the verses around it, the chapter, the book, but also with the teachings and bringing in alignment with the teachings of the entire uh, Bible, all of Scripture. Because some people take this verse and they use it and say, this is saying that everyone will be saved. Whether they believe in Jesus, don't believe in Jesus, whether they don't believe there's a God at all, or whatever. They're, they teach everyone will be saved and go to heaven. Now, it's unbelievable the number of people that have that thought or that belief in mind. If somebody dies, it doesn't matter. It, they might have never even thought about accepting Christ as their Savior. They might have been the worst scoundrel that ever lived. But everybody wants to say, well, they're in a better place. Guys, that's not so. The Scripture is crystal clear. There's one way to forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven with God. And it is through Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Me. So those that teach that all will be saved, they, they need to reconcile this verse with all the rest of the Scripture that teaches something contrary. They use a verse like this, they say there's universal salvation, and they ignore all the remaining verses of Scripture that clearly present the fact that there is no such thing as universal salvation. But yet, it's out there, people teach it, people believe it. There's just all kinds of things out there that are not true. I was uh, watching Fox News uh, Friday afternoon or something, I guess, and they had this guy, Waters World, you probably know who I'm talking about, goes around and asks people all kinds of questions all over the country. It's amazing how, how, how stupid people are. They don't even know who, who the first president was or, you know, probably don't even know who the present president was, is. But, I mean, all kinds of questions, it's just people don't, they're just really like, I can't believe you don't know that, you know. But one guy said something interesting. He said that the God that the Muslims worship, Allah, is the same God that the Christians worship. That's wrong. 
That is an absolute out and out heresy. But it is amazing how many people in churches today are coming to believe because they're being taught that that's the case. And so it's this whole idea and the devil's promoting this even through Christian churches that there's more than one way to God. And when you talk about worshiping God, you can call Him whatever name you want to and it's still God. That's not true. And it's a shame that it's being believed and it's a shame that it's being taught. Because if people are not taught the truth, they will spend an eternity separated from God being punished for their sins. So for a preacher like me or some other preacher to stand up and say, look guys, there's one way to heaven and that's it. That's not a bad thing. That's not be, me being uh, intolerant or biased or closed-minded. It's saying what the Bible says. And it's the only thing that can save someone is to hear that and do what they need to do about that information. The worst thing I could do as a preacher to you guys is to come here on Sunday morning and say, yeah, worship Allah, same God. You know, really the truth is all of you are saved. You don't even have to believe in Jesus. You don't even have to believe there's a God in heaven. Because God is so loving and God is so good, every one of us are going to go to heaven when we die. Now a lot of people would like to hear that. And a lot of people are hearing that. They're having their ears tickled. And they like it. But that, if God doesn't intervene and get truth to them, will be the thing that will help send them to hell. So no preacher, no spiritual person of any kind is doing anybody a favor by telling them, yeah, God and all of the same. You don't need Jesus. Just have some kind of faith and belief and you're going to be okay. Do the best you can do and it's going to all come out okay. All of those are lies from the devil. The same tempter that tempted Adam and Eve is tempting us. And so, he's saying then, in Adam all die. But what he means when he says, in Christ all are made alive, is all who have believed in Christ. Because that's what brings it into reconciliation with all the rest of the Scriptures that's being spoken of in conjunction with what it takes to make a person right with God. See what I'm saying? So this matter of proof texting, just pulling one verse out and just making it say something that it's not really saying in its context, is serious business. And a lot of people are guilty of that. And it's to their own detriment that they do that. Because we have to understand Scripture through the whole of Scripture. I can take this Bible and, and prove text, and I can pretty much prove anything that you want to do is okay. At some place, I can get something out of the Old Testament or the New Testament, take it out of context, twist it around, tweak it, and I can make it say anything I want it to say. But that doesn't mean it's the truth because it's not being reconciled with the rest of Scripture. So, let's look now at verse uh, 23. It says, But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at His coming. Now here Jesus, uh, Paul makes it clear that there is an order of the resurrection. He's making it clear that there is a resurrection. And now he's saying there's an order to the resurrection. All are not raised at once at the same time. And he's pointing out first here that Christ is the first fruits. Now, in other words, Christ is the one that was raised first. He's the proof and the forerunner of the others who will be raised. But he's the one that was raised first. Now, later those as we've seen who are Christ at His coming 
will be raised. And this goes back and adds emphasis to what we just taught about the fact that meaning all will be made alive, meaning all who are in Christ. Because it's showing clearly that all who are in Christ will be resurrected and made alive like Christ has been. Now, the only ones then that we need to realize here resurrected with Christ at this other point in time are going to be those who have placed faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That, that involves a recognition of sin. The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Back again, if you, if a person lives long enough to be old enough to be accountable for their actions, the, the choosing to do wrong when they knew it was wrong was their first sin. And that made them a sinner. Every one of us have fallen into that category. And because of that, as we said a while ago, we were made spiritually dead and separated from God at that point. But God loves us so much that He wants us to spend eternity with Him that He sent Jesus to live a sinless life, to die on a cross, shedding His blood to cover my sin and your sin. If you and I would recognize our sin, and come to faith in Him. Accepting the fact that we can be made right with God only by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior who paid the price for us. That's salvation. And that's what it takes to enter heaven. A lot of people say, well, you know, I quit doing this and I quit doing that and I started going to church, so now God will accept me. No, He won't. Our best is filthy rags to Him. If one sin was all we ever committed and lived perfect the whole rest of our life, which not one of us could do or have done, that still wouldn't make us like a God. The one sin has to be covered. And that's all it takes. And you see in the Old Testament that all the sacrificial system. All the killing of those animals and putting the blood on the altar, all of that was teaching people one thing. That they sinned, the law taught them that, and the fact that sin can only be covered with blood. Something has to die to cover sin. And what God was doing with all those lambs and all that stuff then was preparing people and teaching them to be ready to recognize Jesus when He came and Jesus being the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Animal sacrifices will not remove sin. But the blood of Jesus has the power to remove sin and to remove it forever has the power to make the person who comes to faith in Christ be as though they had never sinned and be able to go into the presence of God and be accepted as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the truth. And it's all by grace and not by works. You can't earn it. I can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We have to receive the free gift. Now, what he's talking about here, and Jesus being the first fruits and the proof then of the resurrection of the others who believe in Him. The, the coming of Christ that he's referring to here refers to the first phase of the second coming of Christ. The Bible teaches that Jesus is coming again. But we must understand that it's going to be in two phases. Just like the Bible prophesied of His coming in the beginning, but until He came and lived it out, a lot of those things didn't really make sense. And so, in the same way, there's going to be a second coming of Christ, but there's going to be two phases of it. 
1 Corinthians 15, 50 and 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, both show us about this first phase. And what's going to happen in that first phase is it's referring to the resurrection of all the believers who have died. And that's what we talked about before. Those who are asleep. So because Christ has been raised from the dead, a day is coming when Jesus will come with the, the believers, spirit, and soul. He will come and He will raise them out of their grave wherever they are. And He will recreate them in a resurrection eternal body just like His. Join that soul and spirit together and catch them up into heaven to meet Him in the, in the air. Now, the other thing that will happen simultaneously with that is simply this. Jesus will come at a time that we do not know and all the living Christians, all who have been saved through faith in Christ, they're going to all be changed instantaneously. Will not die, but will be changed into the same resurrection eternal bodies like Jesus has. And the two groups, the dead Christians and the living Christians, will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, that we shall forever be with the Lord. And that's what we're talking about here when you hear someone talk about the rapture of the church and the coming of Jesus. That's the way it's going to be. And uh, let me just simply say that if you read in the New Testament about all the signs and in reading the Old Testament about the prophecies and all the things that need to be fulfilled and the things that are going to happen that will indicate the nearness of Jesus' return, then if you're not aware of that, you would be shocked to know just how close it really is. It is imminent that Jesus will return soon simply because many, many, many prophecies have been fulfilled in just my lifetime that indicates how close we really are to His return. So, both the, the, the dead Christians and the living Christians will be caught up or the word is used raptured to meet the Lord in the air. Now, both of those groups will go back up into heaven with Jesus. We will be there for seven years. And certain events will take place during that period of time. But what's going to be taking place on earth in that seven years is the tribulation. The Antichrist will be ruling and it will be the worst time that the world has ever known or will ever know, particularly the, the last three and a half years of it. And all those that were not saved when Jesus came will be left behind. And they will have to go into that tribulation period with the Antichrist and all the things that are going to happen. If you've ne never read the book of Revelation, then read the book of Revelation because you're going to see the horrible things that will take place during that period of time for all those who are not saved through faith in Christ. But at the end of that period of time, Jesus will come down with all those that He had taken up seven years before that were His. He will come down at the end of the seven years to the battle of Armageddon where the Antichrist, the kings from the from the east, all the people will be gathered in the valley of Jehoshaphat to bring one final attempt to destroy Israel. And Jesus will come with all the raptured saints and He will bring an end to that. Have you ever thought how funny it is that the whole world wants to see this little tiny narrow strip that Israel has to see the Jews destroyed? It's biblical. It's biblical. The devil wants to destroy them. And there are people out there to do it. I mean, it doesn't matter. Nothing, nothing makes sense with the focus always being on Israel. Always something happening with Israel. It's biblical. God made it that way. And all of those things are indicating 
that we're getting closer. I talked last week about the blood moons. The four blood moons started April 2014. They will run to September 2015. And we're already seeing the events that are taking place with Israel going into war with, with uh, Hamas in Gaza and all of that are just indications of that which God revealed hundreds of years earlier with the formation of these blood moons as it talks so much about it in Scripture. We see the events of that happening right now. But what's going to happen then in Revelation 19, 7-19 is the saints are coming down with Him. He's going to bring an end to that battle of Armageddon and will usher then us into the thousand year millennial reign here on earth with Christ. So, he's saying then that the dead believers then will receive the resurrection, their resurrection bodies, and the living believers when Jesus comes in that second phase will be with Him and all of that will bring the culmination of the end of the second coming of Christ we will be with Him forever. And He will give the thousand year period of time on earth where the devil will be bound. Uh, and we'll have a thousand years under the rule of Christ here on earth. But those Christians who have died that will be resurrected, those Christians who are alive when Jesus comes, we will spend that, that thousand years in resurrection bodies with Him on this earth ruling and reigning with Him uh, as, as Christians. It's going to be an incredible period of time. And you can read about that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, let's bring this to a close. Christ has been raised from the dead. Because Adam sinned, we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sin, Adam's sin resulted in physical and spiritual death. So we inherited the physical part of it. But when we sinned on our own, then we died spiritually and had the spiritual effect of it. And at that point we died and we were separated from God. But God has provided the means by which that we can be born again spiritually. Hence the term that people use about being a born again Christian. Meaning you're born again spiritually. You died from, by sin. But through faith in Christ, you're born again spiritually. So all of those who have died and all those who are here when Jesus comes will have that resurrection into eternal life. Jesus is coming soon, and He will bring that resurrection to pass. Now, the only way that anyone on the face of this earth can be prepared for Jesus to come doesn't matter whether you die before He comes or whether you're here when He comes. The only way to be prepared is to do as I said earlier. To recognize your sin, turn from the sin, and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Accept Him as the one who paid the price. Put all your eggs in one basket to go to heaven. All my eggs are in one basket. It's Jesus and what He did for me. It has nothing to do with me and what I do. I am saved by the grace of God. It's a free gift. And that's the only way any of us are going to be saved. Now, once we are saved as, through that free gift, yes, we are then supposed to live and serve Him. But even then, we have no power to keep ourselves saved. Because as long as we're in this body, no matter how much we mature in Christ and we should mature and overcome areas of sin in our life. But as soon as we overcome one area, He's just going to show us another we didn't even know about. Because in this physical body, we will not escape sin. But the plan is out there. Jesus has died and everything has been done so that every one of us, if we will do what God says, we can have the absolute assurance and the proof that we're forgiven and we're going to be resurrected at a point in the future and have a resurrection body just like Jesus and spend forever and ever and ever in heaven with Him. Now, 
If you're here this morning and you can look at your life and you can say, you know, I have never done that. All these years, I've just never really understood that and I, I've never done that. Today can be the day for you to do that. That's the good news. <clears throat> We're going to have a prayer team over to my right in just a moment to close the service. I would encourage you, I would plead with you if you have never given your heart to Jesus in that fashion, do that today. Don't feel embarrassed. Everybody here will be happy for you. Uh, they probably won't even notice you going over there anyway because everybody will be visiting and talking. <laughs> but go over and let them pray with you or answer any questions you have. If you're here and you have been saved through faith in Christ and you've never followed in water baptism, I want you to come to me. I want to talk to you about the importance of that. We'd love to get you baptized this summer before cold weather comes. So please do that. Nobody's going to make you do it or push you. I just want to talk with you about it. If you have been saved through faith in Christ, you have been water baptized, but you look at your Christian life and you say, you know, I'm just not living the way God wants me to. I'm not using my time, my talents, my money, my spiritual gift. I'm not seeking God. I'm not living for Him. Then God would have you recommit your life to Him and begin to be and do all He wants you to be and do. He wants to use you. And He wants to bless you while you're here on this earth. And the only way that He can bless us the way He wants us, He wants to bless us, is if we as Christians will walk with Him and, and live our lives in accordance with His will. So you may want to make that recommitment. Our offering bucket is to my left. If you'd like to participate in the ministry that this church involves itself in, then just feel free to drop in your tithes and offerings. If you can stay and eat with us, please do so. Uh, we have a good time visiting and eating. 12.30, we're going to be heading out. I will, at that point in time, disclose the destination of the ride and the drive. Name off some of the different various uh, pies that they have. Do a greater description of that mudslide dessert. And, uh, you know, it's just like, if, you don't, if you're not there, you're just going to miss it. That's all I can say. <laughs> The people that are going to be in the video, uh, you need to be there at 12.30. So you probably need to leave here no later than 12 o'clock to get there. Would you go see Belinda, my wife? Everybody knows Belinda, my wife. She has the directions to get you there. And uh, you know, this may be it. If he gets big on this, somebody may see you and say, hey, we got to have that guy in the next movie. No. <laughs> I tried to I tried to send sticks, but his bike was broke down. Oh. I know if he'd have gone there, have wanted him in a movie. Oh, okay. I would have loaned him a bike. <laughs> Thank you.